Lawrence, great to have you here. Very happy to be able to introduce you. Very valuable for our community, especially in the new developments of uh, variable fonts, because you've done so many, uh, so many things, being both an advocate and someone pushing forward uh, the, the technology, offering us the very first playground, which is Axis Praxis, and then talking about variable fonts on conferences. But this time, no variable fonts. This time, variable timetables from trains, because they're supposed to run on time, but it's not always the case. Yes, this talk is indeed about fonts containing trains. Locomotives, carriages, wagons to be composed however you like. Short trains, long trains, slow trains, fast trains, old trains and new trains. And we won't forget the railway track. Sounds fun, doesn't it? I hope to show not only that typesetting trains and track is a reasonable thing to do, but also that having trains on the mind can provoke new ways of thinking about digital typography. I want to start with a very charming book that I bought a couple of years ago, Printer's Trains by William Fenton, with contributions by Kenneth Day and James Mosley, published by the Winkind Award Society in 1969. The first regular passenger railway service between two cities was the Liverpool and Manchester Railway in 1830, and by 1839 much of Britain's national rail network was built, or being built. Printers had an insatiable demand to fill for timetables, posters, guidebooks, shareholders' reports and so on. In particular, typefounders fulfilled the printer's needs to produce pictures of trains as modular repeated elements locomotives, carriages and wagons at standard type sizes so they could be easily incorporated into compositions. Let me show you some of the book. This first page is from uh, Thorogood, 1842. Uh, there are a couple of interesting, interesting things to look at. First of all, the prices. We see the first set is uh, 12 shillings the set, or two shillings and sixpence each. The second set just 10 shillings, a bit smaller, or two shillings each. Uh, the sizes are interesting too. The first one is four line pica, pica being 12 points, so that means four times 12, 70, uh, sorry, 48 point each piece of type. Uh, two line English is 14 points, so two line English body means 28 points. Here's a giant one now. 18-line uh, pica for that locomotive is eight means 18 times 12, 216 points. 14-line pica for the tender, 168. Um, 168 points for the tender and those two trailers. The carriage is there, 16, uh, 16 pikas. And those standard sizes would have made them easy to typeset in standard uh, compositions. There's uh, more from Caslon there. Uh, again, uh, 10 shillings the set, one shilling and sixpence for each one. You'll notice these are all British. That's because the samples in the book are all from the St Bride's collection. So how are they used? Here's an 1849 timetable that's reprinted in the book. Uh, the uh, train there, decorative at the top, advertising the fact it's for, for trains. Here's a poster from 1844 where the Newcastle and Carlisle Railway is encouraging you to go to the hiring fair to get a job. Notice that only two different types are used to, present, but to print all nine carriages. And here's an 1839 table of distances and fares by Drake with a selection of unique carriages and goods wagons. An important question is how was this type made? Well, James Mosley in the book writes that sizes up to 60 points would have been made just as they made their letters. Steel punches making a copper matrix in which you cast lead type. Above that size, Mosley describes a kind of stereotyping documented at Stevenson Blake and known as dabbing. A wood or brass original engraving is pressed into molten lead to get a matrix, and then the final type is cast from that. Quite a tricky process to get the temperatures just right. In the later 19th century, the method would have switched to electrotyping, 
that favourite of the 19th century font cloner. And that me method, electrotype, would probably have lasted until the decline of metal type. So these have all been trains in profile so far. Excellent graphic potential, modular, very recognisable. There's another graphic aspect of railways, the plan view, the railway track itself. And I remembered some 19th century publications that do represent the railway track. First is a series from James Wilde, started in 1838, who published a series of railway guides. At the end of each one, you find an itinerary. It starts on that right-hand page there. From, this is going to go from Paddington all the way to Bristol. We can see he's using nothing in the way of interesting new type. And the track is represented mainly by the layout. There's a cross for stations and a sort with four parallel lines, which suits railways quite well, but it's inconsistently used. Now we're at Bristol. Cole's Travelling Charts, published by railway, the Railway Chronicle magazine, 1846, is much more interesting. interesting. There's the whole map, which uh, unfolds concertina style. The type has very likely been cast especially for this work. The pieces of schematic railway, branches to the left, the right, or both, bridges and termini. Stations are simply bold type between stretches of track. One thing that's really nice is that it is to scale, one inch to the mile. The Railway Chronicle published a series of about 10 of these. This one's London to Southampton. There's also London to Brighton and a really long London to Birmingham. It must have been a pleasure to typeset the graphical type in the central column between two normal columns of text and very cheap compared to the alternative, which would have been to commission engravings, which of course necessitate not just the expense of engraving, but also two runs through the press. Then there's this one a bit later, Bemrose of Derby published a series of panoramic guides around 1874. This uses the same idea as the travelling charts we just saw, again avoids the expense of engraving, and will be easy to typeset. It's more slapdash, not to scale, but it is to my mind saved by its cute trains that chuff up and down the lines, again special pieces of type, and the stations are also interesting. The station type evidently has a hole, so you can set the name of the station inside it. Now, I don't claim this is an exhaustive study, but the number of train fonts you find is rather small, I have to admit. When they do appear in specimen books, they're very often in 3D perspective, so not useful for use as modular graphics. Here's an example from Letraset, not a particularly uh, beautiful example. And here's one from Mechanorma. Again, we see this, the 3D effect. Here's, uh, again, this is a 20th century, late 20th century style of how uh, showing you the carriage to get in according to your reservation. I, I would say this is a kind of typesetting because it's a modular graphical unit. Whether those are actually fonts behind there is unlikely, but they are, to my mind, typographic. Let's talk about some digital fonts for trains now. Uh, let's uh, first of all search my fonts to see if there are any there. Here are some from Ingramain Foundry. Uh, they're, let's call them fun typefaces. Uh, more interesting is this one from Greater Albion Type Founders, a font called Pardon Me Boy. And here it is in use. Uppercase and lowercase switch between left facing and right facing. You get a big range of different locomotives by typing the uh, A to Z. And then the numerals give you the, um, give you the wagons and carriages.
yeah, nice bit of work. Not on my fonts is uh, railfonts.com. Um, published some font, some locomotives and wagons digitized and published by the Anthracite Railroads Historical Society in the US. Lots of different trains to collect, all compatible in terms of scale, so you can mix and match your rolling stock. There are alphabet fonts too. They use the uppercase and lowercase method for right left pointing, almost all of them in silhouette view. The EMD F7 there at the top right, much loved by American rail fans, is given the honour of a non-silhouette silhouette view, digitised like an engineering diagram. It's a lot of fun to build up these trains, make them really long and animate them. Here's, uh, um, again, I would call this typographic. It's platform graphics, uh, this one in France, showing me which carriage in the TGV I should get into. You can see the display is quite long to accommodate long trains and different numbering on the, on the carriages. So it's a, a pretty versatile system. And the modern equivalent of the, um, the sign you saw in the previous section. What about new font technology and trains? Uh, first of all, I'll talk about emoji. Uh, I'll take you through a few of the emoji train pieces. They face either forward to the left or to the left, uh, the left facing, uh, deriving from the right to left writing of Japan, where emoji originates. That's not in itself a problem. It's easy to fix with CSS transform. Um, you can just about make some train sets out of them. Um, so there we are. That's the Apple train set. Uh, it's not really compatible though, those carriages with any of um, the locomotives, unfortunately. And everything's in that square emoji format. Surely the most extreme abbreviation possible for a train. Um, and as we saw the station and the rail track emoji are facing towards us. And most of the rolling stock is pointing to the left. So it, it's not really very usable in a for a modular system. But they are color, so let's see what um, Type Archer is doing with color. He's the master of color fonts. So uh, he's released this font called Gimme Chugger, which has these very colorful capitals. And then in the, in the lowercase and on the brackets, you get these uh, smaller versions. And it's, there's some really lovely detailing if you zoom in. These are not fonts. Um, they're some posters that uh, Andy Arthur uploaded to Flickr a couple of years ago. Uh, but I really like them. They're all, they, they do seem to me to be typographic. They're British train designs recreated in a uniform scale and style that would work very well as colour fonts uh, for handy use by a railway company or a railway buff. Let's take a look at some track type now. And there's not much out there, but here are some nice examples of the so-called root diagram template in Wikipedia. The template gives you lots of square pieces to build schematic no networks of railways, waterways and roads. To me, these are highly typographic and yet the diagrams are very fiddly to create. I can imagine some people giving up and drawing an illustrator instead. Storing all these pieces in a colour font seems like a great idea. Now I show this because of the coupling rods. Let's uh, have a look at it again. Now, to me, that cries out for being animated with Underwear's wonderful Hoi technology, um, not just moving the train along, but animating all the, that beautiful um, mechanical motion and, uh, for the wheels and pistons. Um, so I haven't had time to actually do that, um, but I think that'd be a great thing to do. Uh, and we can start to imagine the ultimate train font 
locomotive font based on modern font technology. It would be color. It would have Hoy coupling rods. And we'd probably want to base it on some accurate engineering drawings. So let's get some trains moving and see what animation possibilities CSS gives us. So what we get is in CSS is control over a distance time graph using a cubic Bezier curve. Using this neat site, cubicbezier.com, we can adjust our curve and copy and paste the CSS that generates. But it's impossible to get what we really want, which is the train starting from rest at a station, speeding up to maximum speed, then slowing down and stopping at the next station. In terms of a distance time graph, we want a straight line in between two curves. We could run three animations one after the other, but the calculation of all the parameters is tricky and there's no way to chain them. We have an option, but to hack it with JavaScript using the acceleration formula that you remember from school. Here's a little code pen demo I made where you can compare CSS linear, CSS ease in out, You see, neither of those is satisfactory. And a JavaScript impl impl implementation of that simple acceleration formula with some control over the maximum speed. And here's the same demo using the TGV from Rail Fonts. To be clear, I'm not proposing that CSS needs a physics model like a modern video game. But it still seems CSS is shortchanging animators and video artists. Is it too much to ask that an element accelerates up to a steady speed, continues for a given period, then decelerates and stops? So is this all about trains? Well, I think it's more widely useful. Uh, the, animated, um, let's, the animated view of traveling charts I showed earlier, I would have liked to do the same way. So speed up, then steady speed, then slow down. It's a standard tool in the toolbox of the film editor or the cinematographer. The tracking shot and the panning shot do exactly this. The end credits in old movies typically show the end. Then after a few seconds, this gently scrolls upwards and continues scrolling at the same speed for several minutes, listing the cast and crew. Quite a reasonable thing to do typographically, isn't it? The transition from still to moving was gentle acceleration again. So we talked about train movements and animation in general. I hope the potential for train style layout is already obvious in all sorts of modular graphics, including much of information design. I want to finish with an idea that certainly suits modular graphics, that I think is also typographic and suitable for fonts, though not with current font formats. One thing that occurred to me when thinking about all the examples we've seen is they're all a bit rectilinear. Why not allow curves too? And I remembered the Lego train set I had as a kid. Uh, yes, I'm from the blue era. And I thought, I want to type that track. So for this idea to work with the curves, we'd need to store not just the outline data for each glyph, but also a rotation and an X and a Y offset that should happen after displaying the glyph. So in this font, each curved glyph rotates the cursor 22 and a half degrees, displaces a certain X and Y so that we are ready for more track. Here's a simple JSON format I put together that could be added in a new open type table. And why not branches? Certain glyphs giving you two possible cursor positions for the next glyph. Of course, it's not going to work in apps unless everyone agrees that it's a good idea. But before that, we can try it out with a tiny bit of JavaScript to read the new table and lay out the font correctly on our website. Is this all about Lego railway layouts? layouts? Well, no, it's potentially much more than that, of course. Many kinds of modular graphics can be simplified this way, including information design and typographic decoration, which can become really easy to construct. I hope you've enjoyed this little journey through train typography. Do let me know what you think, and especially if you do anything with train typography yourself. Thank you. Hi, there you are again. Hey.
Okay. Oh, well, I hope you enjoyed that. I didn't expect yeah. that to go there. That's really fascinating. It was like, okay, this is nice and vintage stuff. They're like, whoa, all right, this is uh, something more. So I'm looking for people. Oh, everybody doing the train. Great train of thoughts. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Uh. There's a lot of wordplay in, in the chat, which is pretty funny. I don't know if anybody has an actual question for Lawrence. Um, yeah, you know the little interrogation mark. You click it there. So yeah, what, what I was uh, noting in in the in the um, in the chat is what you showed these emojis that you see. Uh, the more the emojis get perfected and finished, the less useful they seem to be because there is a really clear disconnect between the actual concept and then the detailing of the illustration because they were the locomotives were like half locomotives and then the yeah. wagon so to you're right i think if they had use... been if susan Kerr had designed them in 1989 84 or something like that they'd be they'd just be one carriage and exactly a of locomotives one modern one steam and you they'd be really that's usable. You're, 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 you're right that they're, they're too detailed to, to match anymore yeah because then when you saw the, the they would need to have also all the different types of wagons because they distinguish between different types of locomotives. But then, yeah, and all their different wonder, liveries. You know, the yeah. TGV from the nineties looks different from the TGV from exactly. the early eighties. This kind of thing. And how yeah. how practical is it still then to start using them? Because instead of having one sign, you have to scroll through like all different iterations, which makes it really impractical. <clears throat> um, okay. Oh, I wanted uh, to thank. Uh, uh, I forgot to in the talk. I forgot to thank Florian, Florian Hardvig for he was um, my dry transfer um, researcher. He came up with the. I realized my twentieth century research is pretty incomplete, and there are surely lots of nice, liver, especially livery diagrams in um, yeah. rail company uh, identity manuals and so on that I haven't didn't have time to research. But um, thanks, Florian. So there's still more people chatting away in the chat, but no real questions. Uh, people are really complimentary. They really liked it. And uh, I think, yeah, no, lots of comments during the presentation, but no real, real questions. Okay. Uh, I would say um, if, oh, hold on. Finally, somebody found, oh. okay. Um, Oh, yes. So Craig Elison asks, were trains among the only illust illustrative metal swords that combined in strings? Uh, that's a good question. And I don't know. I'd love to hear from other people who know these old specimen books much better than I do. Yeah, because you had the classical borders and so on, but they could not be considered illustrations. That's more like ornaments. So there would be other things that combine in strings, which what could that be actually? Like, uh, well, I, I mean, this is the book that I was showing things from. Some versions of it don't have the colorful cover, and okay. it's it's just it's that thick, and it's a lovely little book. I highly recommend it. It's only there's several on sale. Oops, there's several on sale now for twenty pounds or something like that. But I'd love to know what was around these um, in the specimen books. What was on the previous pages? That would be interesting. Okay, Buzz uh, asked a question in the wrong section of the chat, but we'll still uh, <laughs> read it out loud. Um, Buzz Jacobs asks, can you show the physically longest train map from your personal collection? Do you have one at, at hand or do you have to go through boxes? Um, well, actually, I didn't prime uh, Buzz with that question, but I do have this um, London to Birmingham one here. Um, but I, I don't know how I'm going to... Sure, yeah, it, effectively. The screen is pretty small, so it's hard. Yeah, so it's and it's well, it's not two maps. Let me see. You you two can maps. do the the credit crawl, credit scroll. Yeah. So, can you see that? Oh yeah, that's so, that one. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah. So yeah, I was wondering, yeah. I saw on, on these old maps, they showed also the bridges and so on. Is that for people to be able to kind of guess, all right, my next stop will be then or so, that they could see, oh, now we're crossing the river, now we're crossing that bridge? 
I, I think back then there was such a fascination with this new method of trans of transport that a bridge was fascinating. These, you know, everything was fascinating about about the railway. So, you know, fifteen years after the very first railway service, you show them everything. You don't know what's going to be interesting long term. Yeah, yeah. And you know, ultimately. People put their headphones on and, and and disappear inside a some music or something, and and hopefully they don't miss their stop, and that's the end of their experience of the of the train because they're so blasé about train travel. But it uh, but those uh, highly detailed uh, depictions did, of course, uh, remain in professional use. So for the people, the the line operators, and I, I have a for comparison. So here's a relatively modern um, book book that would have been i think used by a train driver so it's it takes the line oh yeah like like to, to folks to... like a road map because even though the, the tracks are guiding the train you still have to know where you are and, and so on yeah yeah so, so this is for professional use and does cover all the bridges and that's stuff great like that. but this is but this is not easily legible by passengers but it's still an interesting piece of inform information design exactly so um, um Maurice Meyer is wondering um, how that long piece was printed. Is that one paper, or, or how do you think that uh, was? There, you do find joins, yes, in in these long, long, long maps. They are. I can. I think maybe four pieces glued together. That's typical for these accordion fold maps. Yeah, you see, there's a. So still, people are. There's a joint there. Can you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. So they were there was glued or something, or, or is it, were they glued. bound or glued? Yeah, this is very, this is very cheaply made. The sort of cover is paper, a slightly different stock uh -huh. from the from the rest of the paper. So they're pretty fragile things. I think that it's um, yeah, they wouldn't be intended to last 150 years like just a few of them have. Oh, there is a question for me off topic. Did you actually have one single question in this box during the whole conference? Because I've never saw it used, but maybe it's that one. It is that one doesn't see other people's questions. No, I, do, does anybody see other people's questions? This is the first time somebody asked this. If, if you click on, on the question mark. No, no, uh, it's only the present. It's only you and me who see those those questions. Ah, that's why. So we okay. should we should be careful to try and read them out. Yeah, that's why I'm doing that. I was told to do that, so I take care to also say who asked the question. Um, okay, um, Salome Desai. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, asks, what's the name of the book by James Mosley? Oh, it's simply Printers Trains. So, I'll show you the title page. No, this one. Yeah, very cute little book. Okay, Adam is asking a question in the main. I hope it's a question. I don't know. Do you think that the way to travel to these spaces via trains or roads, how does it connect to the idea of expressing many dimensional thought space with a line of words? Uh, <laughs> this is above my uh, pay grade. I hope I, you understand this. I didn't understand that. Let me. Okay, so do you think that the way to travel to these spaces via trains of, or roads, how does it connect to the idea of expressing many dimensional thought space with a line of words? Uh, I think that uh, maybe Adam's referring to some conversations we've had about this. Yes, I do think there is a connection. The, the idea of you've got this complex thought that you want to express and all you the only way you have to express it is by a stream of symbols. So, so you have to come, you have this converter, which we call some language ability that converts from this multidimensional chaos to the stream. So I think there is a, uh, a relationship there, but some two dimensional arrangements, certainly we can hit us directly. We don't, without us needing to interpret them as lines i think exactly so that's where good graphics comes from all right i think we're done with the questions unless i see something else oh somebody's still yeah so type typography whoa so type typography text 
could be thought of as 1D maps of thinking. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. All right. This is going much cheaper than I expected. Okay. Yeah. Everybody's uh, so Simon Daniels thinks that train fonts need a graf graffiti layer. <laughs> well, in color fonts, it could be possible. <laughs> Multidimensional. Okay. Um, I would say it's 22 11. Um, underwear is on in 20 minutes. Uh, we have this great space, which is the hangout space where people can engage in informal discussion and showcase work and, you know, give ad hoc mentorship and career advice and, and carve pumpkins. And as we're supposed to dress up as well because it's Halloween and Diaz de Muertes. So we'll see what happens over there. So I would suggest if anybody wants to continue the conversation, uh, just move over to the Hangout space where we can meet everyone and then continue talking about whatever we want. And then we will close this session and uh, prepare the next one. So Adam, thank you very much. That was uh, quite unexpected. I really enjoyed it. I was like, where is this going? And I really loved it. So thank you so much for sharing your presentation with us. Thank you, everybody thank who you. attended. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Cheerio.